Um, I'm Richard Kinkle, Mayor of Tasman, and it's my pleasure today to uh, be MC for this afternoon's presentation. And um, I will just, I'll just let you know how we're going to uh, run it. I'm going to be introducing uh, in a minute um, Dr. Jim Salinger, and he will outline climate change science and its impacts on farming and communities. And then Rod Orham, after him, will talk on emissions trading and competing Zealand's climate change targets with our trading partners and what this means for trade. And the way we're going to do it is uh, Jim will speak first, and it'll be roughly 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll just take a few questions, followed by Rod, followed by just a few questions, and then they'll both be up for uh, a panel discussion. We have to um, finish by five, so that's the only time constraints. So we have two speakers and two or three questions, followed by a panel discussion at the end. And you can come to hear me speak. So without further ado, a warm welcome to you both. And I'll hand over now to you, John. Thank you, Richard. And it's lovely to be here. Caroline Saunders apologizes. She unfortunately can't be with us, but Rod will be presenting her material and anything you ask that he doesn't know, it's like who wants to be a millionaire and he finds a friend who's terrible. Um, so, but before I start, um, I just really want to say that rural New Zealand can take the lead and make a difference. Um, we want to share this experience with as many people in the around rural New Zealand as possible and um, we want to take the tour to as many places as possible and obviously the, we had some donations for our travel in terms of Rod, Caroline and me uh, we've, we've donated our time in terms of speaking etc but we do have costs so We'll pass around the collection box and feel free to put whatever you want in it. And um, we need this, your help to keep on this tour. There's also forms and, and ops from our, our bankers. We don't handle the money, so and so it's completely audited, etc., etc. So all the bump. So I'll just start it and you just you want to donate and that's good. Uh, now what I want to talk about today is the science of climate change and its impacts. Um, I'll set the slide. So, and what I want to jump to is the relationship between carbon dioxide and temperature, in other words, the greenhouse. And what I want to tell you is this is well-established science developed over two centuries. And and really the story begins in the 1820s with uh, Joseph Fourier. And he speculated that there were components in the atmosphere that kept the Earth warmer than it otherwise should be. Otherwise, it would be a bit like Mars, very hot during the day, cold at night. The next person in this equation was an Irish earth scientist, John Tyndall, in the 1860s. He found that there were greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that blocked heat from the Earth escaping to space. The next person on the block looking at this was Savant Arrhenius, a Swedish chemist around 1900. He postulated if you doubled carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, then this would raise the temperature by 5 degrees. There's a New Zealand lead to the story, Dr. Apple Rafter, a physical scientist at DSIR in the 1950s, when he was looking at the carbon in the atmosphere and carbon dioxide, he noticed it was getting progressively older. 
so that fossil carbon was building up in the atmosphere. So really the science of greenhouse gases, how it warms the atmosphere, is a story over two centuries. It's not new science, and it's actually not rocket science. It's very easily understood. Um, carbon dioxide, the best estimate of doubling from Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 2007 report somewhere in the order of three degrees, and there's a range of two to four and a half. The carbon dioxide concentration now is 390 parts per million, it used to be 275 parts per million. It's up 38%, but the critical thing is half of that increase has occurred in the last three decades. And the point with carbon dioxide, it stays around in the atmosphere. It doesn't, um, it doesn't disappear. So if it stays around in the atmosphere, it is there for the order of a hundred, one or two centuries. It doesn't disappear. Now, what is the greenhouse effect? And this <coughs> diagram shows you what it is. Um, basically, you have the sun, and from the sun we have solar radiation, which is short-wave radiation. And the gases in the atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen, and the trace gases, which are carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, are totally transparent to what comes from the sun. A third, the Earth is a partial mirror, and a third is reflected back to space. The other two-thirds is absorbed by the Earth's surface. That then re-radiates heat back to space, and the atmosphere, it's a long wavelength, it's infrared radiation, that captures this and re-radiates it back to Earth and out to space. So that's what the greenhouse effect is. So the mean temperature of Nelson area is somewhere around 12 degrees. If those gases went in the atmosphere, that's carbon dioxide, methane, water vapors, greenhouse gas too, the mean temperature of Nelson would be minus 21. So they play a very important role in keeping our biosphere in equal temperatures for the current life on this planet as we know it. So they're very necessary now, what do you think would happen if you add more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere? I it's the sun that's doing it. Uh, no, that's not what the theory says. Um, it's actually the atmosphere will warm because you're putting more heat trapping gases into the atmosphere, and so that's blocking that. Um, blocking that escape to space um, and therefore it's like you and your bed at night um, like last night if you want it to get warmer you put another blanket on your bed and that means you're delaying that heat transfer into the air above you. That's all it is. But it's not rocket science and this I stress has been developed over two centuries. Now, the story in terms of carbon dioxide measurements starts in 1957 when Dave Kelling started measuring carbon dioxide at the top of Moana Lower, that's about the height of Mount Cook, uh, in the clear air, and you can see his measurements, it's about 315 parts per million. We're now at 390 parts per million. And there's measurements in the blue there, uh, initially by DSIR, then by NEWA, the bearing head, similar picture. If we look at carbon dioxide and temperature and methane over the last 650,000 years, basically this here is a curve of temperature as measured in um, Greenland and Antarctic ice cores, and you have variations between interglacials, that's when 
we have the condition of the earth at the moment where you have ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, so it's not totally ice free, but um, there's less ice than glaciers when you have huge ice sheets over North America and Europe. And the temperature difference is about 5 degrees. Um, I think the important thing to note is that greenhouse gases naturally vary between carbon dioxide, 170 parts per million um, in ice ages, 180 up to 270 in the middle of interglacials. Similarly, methane between 400 and 700 parts per million. Uh, so that's geological time. If you look at where methane is now, it's more than doubled. And carbon dioxide, as I said, we're up to 390 parts per million. Um, so an important point is these have increased very rapidly if you look at the long-term geological record. So um, the IPCC, Intergovernmental Plan on Climate Change, has said <coughs> CO2 and methane have increased markedly as a result of human activities, um, fossil fuels, deforestation, agriculture is also a source. Um, so, um, and now the, the highest levels have been for at least 650,000 years, and the latest science is showing several million years. Okay, let's look at sources of climate change. And here we have the average temp the temperature difference from an averaging period. Uh, so in 1862, temperatures were about two tenths of degrees below this average period, whereas in uh, 19, in the year 2000, we're about eight tenths of a degree above. Now, onto this is put the major um, factors that are causing more or less heat in terms of the climate system. Here uh, is the solar cycle, and there's a 11 year solar cycle. Satellites have been able to measure the heat output, or the difference, and it's about 0.1 watt per meter squared. So, the sun does have a small um, effect. When you have major volcanic eruptions, they push sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, and what happens is then this spreads around, hydrolyzes to sulfuric acid, and you have this mist in the stratosphere. It's like an air curtain. And when you have major volcanic eruptions, it's briefly cool for about 12 months or so. And you can see this is about, the big one's a half a watt per metre squared. We see Krakatoa, we see, um, we see Pinatubu. Pinatubo in 1991 was the biggest volcanic eruption in terms of the climatic effect in uh, the community. But this shows you the impact of increasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. What you can see is, remember I said in the last three decades, you've had the big increase. Um, so that's since about 1980. Prior to that, 